and thank you for the invitation to speak here. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to my talk, or our talk. Um, this is the uh, Lunda greeting, Munahandi Mwani, and it means literally, are you alive? And it's a very good baseline for a doctor of any kind, especially a surgeon. <laughs> there was once, I, during the ward round, and I said, Munahandi Mwani, no response. We pulled back the sheet and the patient was beyond all hope of surgery or anything else. So it's a good baseline and I trust you are uh, awake, uh, alive anyhow. Yeah. The, uh, if I was to ask you how you are and then you were to ask me how I am, that would be a different thing because I feel a little bit uh, out of place today. I feel almost that I'm like a an infantry man plucked from the trenches and put in GCHQ, General Headquarters, to give a talk to the generals about the state or the situation at the front line where I am. So hence that's the uh, uh, talk, boots on the ground. Um, surgery in Central Africa. This is myself and uh, Lorraine, my wife, I'm getting uh, this honour tomorrow. It should really be my wife who's getting it, to be honest with you. I have the greatest sympathy for anybody who is married uh, to a surgeon, whether it be a uh, man or woman, but it's a very uh, unenviable thing to be a surgical wife in Central Africa. No theatres, no restaurants, uh, very little, but just to sit there. And you only can go shopping maybe once every four or five months. For the man, it's good, but not so much for our wives. Those are our three boys. The, uh, this one, uh, that went on a little bit. Where are we? The middle one, uh, the little one to the side there, he has just driven his 1992 Land Rover the whole way through Europe and Africa, stopping in on the way with us to do three months uh, surgery. So he is growing up. Um, we've been in two places, as has been mentioned, the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, for, during the 90s, Congo, and during the, the rest of the time we've been in, in Zambia. I'm trying to do probably four things with you tonight, or whatever. Number one, I'm trying to attest to the accuracy of those Lancet Commission figures, at least in the areas of which I have personal experience. I can agree 100% with them. I'm trying to describe to you the state of surgery, uh, what it's like for a doctor on the ground in Central Africa. I want to tell you something of the variety of the work. I want to tell you something of the challenges of it and how rewarding a, a surgery career is in Central Africa. And then um, I, I want to act a bit like a recruiting sergeant. If there's anybody here who would like to join the surgical infantry and become boots on the ground, uh, sign up after the, <laughs> the lecture. And along the way, I want to try and show you something that what a little village in rural Zambia of maybe 15,000 people what they owe to the great city of Glasgow. And I'll show that as we go along, hopefully. Um, so, boots on the ground, personal experience. Uh, that, those are the places, you know the maps anyway, I'm not going into that in detail. Um, there's where we were first of all, it's up there at Malongo, and that's in Congo. Here's where we are now, it's Tokoloki, northwest province bordering Angola as well, so it's pretty, pretty central. Um, we're uh, what we call part of faith-based healthcare. Uh, there was a very interesting article in The Lancet that showed that 80% of the world, believe it or not, you wouldn't think this from the UK, but 80% of the world uh, are still religious. And I, uh, the countries where I work, uh, the faith-based group happens to be Christian. Other countries will have different, uh, different uh, religions. Uh, Christians, we don't always agree with each other, but I picked out uh, three verses that uh, I think everyone that's in the faith-based Christian era will agree with. 
Uh, there is no difference, and uh, Paul wrote that, and men are, all men, women, are equal in the sight of God. For God so loved the world, um, this is a world, God doesn't define anything about race or color or nationality or how much money we have or gender or any of those things. The statement is very unequivocal, God so loved the world. And of course our Lord Jesus said, you should love your neighbor as yourself. And those are the kind of tenets that we try to uh, live by as best we, as best we can. Now, Glasgow, Livingstone. I, I don't need to introduce David Livingstone to you, but if you look back, he's uh, one of the early um, doctors and uh, missionaries to Central Africa. And uh, of course, he um, made the world aware of the slave trade. And he brought, uh, with the help of various organizations, it was eventually brought to an end. I feel that the Lancet has, in some ways, done a similar thing in bringing the state of global surgery to a wider audience. And I think it would be wonderful if there was a similar uh, response to try and eliminate it. Fred Stanley Arnott is another Glaswegian. And this was a man who founded our mission in Central Africa way back in 1881. He left Glasgow for Central Africa. Today we have 12 uh, large uh, health, uh, well, hospitals in Central Africa, largely the result of this one man, uh, Arnott. He actually founded the place where I'm working at the moment at uh, Chitokaloki. That's him, and there is a book written, by him, written about him by another Glaswegian, Ian Burness, just published recently from Glasgow to Garangans. Uh, Zambia. Um, and you superimpose on that the faith-based groups. This is CHAS, which is the umbrella term uh, for the uh, faith-based groups working in Zambia. And you see it's very extensive. There's an awful lot of uh, these places. In fact, uh, the Lancet series, they suggested that upwards of 50% of health care in sub-Saharan Africa uh, was being provided by what they call faith-based uh, groups. Uh, here's history for you, just quickly. 18 month Angolan child, uh, mother is young, very poor, child sick for several days, hospital in Angola has no doctor, uh, so she has to cross the border into Zambia. She goes to the nearest hospital, which was Shavuma, no doctor, she's probably traveled about 40 miles by this stage. Then they have to travel the next 80 miles to the next hospital, which was Zambezi. No doctor, or the doctor that was there, but there was no, uh, he, he couldn't operate on it, on the child. Then they have, she has to go another 25 miles to us. She arrives with us at midnight with a grossly dehydrated infant, distended abdomen, severe pain. Diagnosis is obvious, incarcerated hernia causing bowel obstruction. We did an immediate operation, anesthetic given by a nurse, operation by myself and post-op, the child did well, and a week later, they go back to Angola. That is not atypical. That would be a very typical scenario at our hospital. And that's the type of thing that I leave with you. Why is this type of thing happening in 2018? Why should a mother have to go to that trouble to try and save the life of her child? Uh, Congo, the roads are bad. This is the, if you, if you look at that, it's the motorway on the map, I think. <laughs> it doesn't matter how good an ambulance you have, how fast it can go. That's the way it'll end up. It took me three days once to travel 100 kilometers. That's another one, the same thing. Roads are very bad in Congo. This is Congo. Uh, roads are thankfully better in Zambia. Ray and Ruth Williams, they rang a little, ran a little hospital like ours, small unit. We, we're about a hundred bed hospital, so did they. They ran it for 30 years up in the mountains of Mitwaba. You probably haven't heard of them, or very few even would have heard of the hospital. But they were the only place doing surgery for hundreds of miles in, in any direction. And wonderful couple. Ray has a unique view of surgery. I give him a book once, How to Treat Surgical Patients for less than $2 a day. 
He was completely horrified. David, he said, how could anybody ever spend two dollars a day on a surgical procedure? <laughs> so. Or, uh, their hospital was destroyed in 24 hours after uh, 30 years of being there, serving the population, 24 hours wiped out. That's the operating table, the way the army left it afterwards. Uh, I'd like to talk a long time about Minda. Minda's a wonderful man. He was, he's dead now, but this dear man was trained as a nurse, but he was taught to do three operations. He could do ectopic pregnancy, he could do strangulated hernia and caesarean section. And for 20 years, he was the only surgical, surgical care at that hospital, and he has saved countless lives. Uh, a wonderful person. Um, I could say much more about him, but time won't permit. That's the sort of state of many of our hospitals in, uh, in Congo. <laughs> you put a mat down if you want to, um, if a patient comes in, no mattresses very often. It's a very primitive uh, setup. Uh, this child, um, fractured femur, three days away from the hospital, put on a bike with a tight splint, arrives after three days like that. Uh, loss of limb and very fortunate not to lose, uh, uh, lose his life. I think that, that might be a different one, but that's the, the amputation the next day. A lot of building work in, in Africa, if you're, you don't just get involved in medical care, but you have to be a builder as well, or at least a supervisor. We did a number of big buildings when we were there. Anyway, on to um, Zambia, which is really what I would like to concentrate on tonight. And uh, there is the little hospital that you took a looky. It's got a nurse strip. Most of our mission hospitals, they've got a nurse strip so that you can land and uh, take your patients in, take them out if need be. Uh, on the banks of the river Zambezi, that's uh, one of the big rivers of Africa. Not quite as big as the Clyde, I was noting. It's, uh, <laughs> but it's still wide enough. <laughs> it's flooded here, so. A lot of bilharzia, as David was saying, because of this flooding. And so we get a lot of esophageal varices. Um, don't underestimate, uh, listening to our speaker there tonight, it's easy to sometimes just think of figures on paper, but the logistics of running a hospital in rural Africa are immense. Uh, there's very often no, no electricity, very often no water. So our power now is coming from the solar panels and from the, um, from the, the water tank, uh, borehole. Uh, ambulance. Uh, Sometimes, believe it or not, many of our patients still arrive at the hospital uh, in this ox cart. And they could take maybe 12 hours to get there. Two hours would be exceptional for a patient in our area to get to the hospital. Absolutely unheard of in general. And patients come to you by the lorry load. This was the orthopedic uh, doctor. Emmanuel Macassa might well have been there that day. He did come to us for quite a while. And, but that's the way they come. Uh, maybe the orthopedic doctor was there on Friday. He saw something like 78 people. And the next day he operated on 16 of them, including two hip joint replacements. Some people come up the river by canoe. And you notice they all travel with their food and things because it's certainly not a deluxe hotel they're, they're coming to. Uh, you have these vehicles. Sometimes we have one of those. But, uh, you know, sometimes there's no fuel or whatever. I'm also the chief ambulance controller. So all ambulance calls have to go through me because we cannot uh, send the vehicle out unnecessarily. So it has to be a proper call to get a, an ambulance. Sometimes we'd send it for snake bites and things. Uh, Chitokoloki has been there over 100 years. We had the 100th anniversary just in uh, 1914. Those of you who know the history of Africa. Africa, as, as it's now uh, constituted, is a fairly recent uh, development in regards of modern things. Lusaka as a city was founded, the, the Lusaka the capital was founded in the same year as the Tokoloki uh, mission. Um, we have a plane, and what I'm trying to say too, uh, I haven't mentioned it is, but we just treat the poor people. We treat the folk uh, who the system fails. 
since 99, every patient I have operated, well, since 2002, every patient we have operated on, there has been no charge. There's an agreement with the Zambian government, and they help with medicines and so on, and second staff. Our part of the bargain is not to charge anything. So every patient you're seeing here is treated free. Uh, and uh, in Congo, there was a very small charge, like five pence uh, a week or something, and 50p was our price for uh, an operation. This patient had an ectopic pregnancy and has been transferred in by plane. From we got the call to so the patient was operated on back and back in the in, in the ward was an hour and a half, and uh, all free, uh, no charge to the patient, and very. And that was the team that went for her, two medical students, in fact, and the pilot. And the patients come, this is their, their belongings that they bring to the hospital with them. Uh, very busy, at wards are like this all the time. And uh, you can imagine doing a ward round every, uh, every morning there, trying about 100 people every morning. And you, you, it's a mixture of surgery, medicine, obstetrics, pediatrics. Uh, the whole thing is just all collected together. Um, many patients end up outside, of course, as well. Burkitt's lymphoma, very common at Chitokoloki, discovered by another Irish man. Uh, treated with methotrexate, very easily treated, but uh, methotrexate and uh, cyclophosphamide, sometimes and pristine. Uh, we have a nice operating theatre. Lorraine uh, here assisting a, a visiting Dr. Lipsy. And we have uh, reasonable facilities, but they're, they're small. That's, that's a GIST tumor. Uh, that's our operating theater. Uh, again, another operation. You can see the monitors. We try to monitor our patients as best we can. Uh, two of the greatest books <coughs> ever written on surgery. If you, any young surgeons, those are the books you want to get. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, all the more so because they were edited by an epidemiologist, and so they're understandable, not like most <laughs> modern surgical textbooks. This was my first venture into neurosurgery, and I'm just running through these quickly. Christabel, the ox cart, had crushed her head against a, a stone. Our nurse discovered her about 80 miles away in another hospital. She walked into the ward, she says, what's happened to that child? And they said, oh, there's nothing can be done for that child, she's dying. Her brain was all coming out. This nurse put the child in the back of her pickup, brought her through to me, and she said, there you are, David, operate on this girl. And I said, Tannis, that girl is beyond help. There's nothing can be done. David, I didn't bring that girl here for you doing nothing. <laughs> so against my better judgment, we took her to theater. We gave her ketamine. She fitted three times on the table. There's a piece of uh, uh, skull was sort of at the midline. We took it out. There was a huge gap left. We did a, 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 a fascia lata graft from the thigh, sent her back to the ward to die. And five days later, she woke up and asked for a doll. And she went home uh, very well. So it taught me one thing, was never ever to give up on a patient unless I have uh, uh, very good reason. That was her there. Uh, eye surgery, we do a lot of eye surgery. These microscopes came from Ireland, from the NHS, uh, cast-offs. And so I can do cataracts. Any general surgeon can do, do cataracts. I, I got about a few weeks training with Dr. Yaffe there from Ghana. And it's not that difficult. We put in implants with the help of the, the microscopes. And uh, uh, those are three people that had their cataracts done, come to the hospital uh, blind and are able to go home seeing. Again, very rewarding work. Uh, this is Alfred, or we call him Peanut, uh, to us because he was found again a long distance away. This is a very frightening situation. You find a child who's this age uh, with something in his airway and he, his oxygen saturations are maybe 50 and you're in the middle of the night and you have to do something. It's quite terrifying. And our way of resolving it, we didn't have any equipment, was we did a tracheostomy and we used a Fogarty catheter uh, to pull out the peanut. And we've done uh, many cases like that now. There's the peanut. And uh, uh, <laughs> lots of ENT stuff. <laughs> what children swallow. This is keys. Uh, <laughs> and uh, 
again, quite frightening to get out. Uh, it was like a, some kind of a puzzle trying to get them bent. I don't know. Um, clutch of coins, uh, another problem. Again, down they go, down the, uh, the thing. We devised a technique using the image intensifier and just an ordinary arty forcep or a big long thing that you could use for a sigmoidoscope. And uh, it's very, it works very well because they usually are vertical. And <laughs> success. <laughs> and there it is, that's the coin uh, mostly out, using the image intensifier. Um, but again, it can be frightening. Um, sarcoma on a tongue. Uh, maxillary tumour here, big one, and uh, again that was operated on, taken out and did quite well. Uh, this was a, a mandibular tumour, amyloblastoma. Again we did a hemimandibulectomy, uh, that was it there. Uh, and uh, this is her a few years later, uh, doing very, very well. Um, everything tends to be big in Africa, as you've gathered. And, uh, so thyroids tend to not be the small variety. Uh, we do that very often under local, and uh, it's very good because then you're sure you don't cut the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, what does that hurt afterwards? Yeah. Um, a lot of age, all your work is against a constant background of AIDS, 14%, 10 to 14, probably 10% in our area. Small place, 15,000 catchment area in our, and about 400 patients on treatment, including 24 children. I am nominally, nominally in charge of the HIV program, but I, in reality, I don't have much to do with it. Uh, and also the background of malaria, constant malaria. Yeah. And what I also would like to say is, I have an open access policy. I am accessible to all the staff all the time. If I do one operation, I'm usually interrupted by about five different people because you can't leave children. They come to you with the case, they want to know, should we give blood, should we do this, should we do that? So I have an open access thing. I'm accessible all the time. Um, burns, a lot of burns. Uh, that's, um, uh, and we use the old knives to sort them out uh, with, uh, uh, this is traction, Chitovaloki style. Uh, elephantiasis, another big thing. A little boy with a, uh, a, a, a contractor. Uh, Roz is a pediatrician. Um, she's with us for six months or it's half the year now. She looks after these handicapped children who, as John mentioned, are very often neglected in, in healthcare uh, all over. A little child with a Stove in chest from TB, needed surgery, we couldn't get it. He died, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> these characters are very, that's a mamba. Um, it was in my wife's uh, box door one day. Um, that's him, the, the black mouth. Um, this child was bitten by a snake like that, rushed from the nearby hospital. Uh, trust into my hands after he finished a case by a nurse. She says, Doctor, I have prayed the whole way that God would keep this child breathing. We got to Chitogoloki. Uh, that about, was about maybe 30, 30 miles. We took her in and she took what was probably her last breath in theatre, a half a breath. We intubated her. We gave her antivenom. Two days later, two hours later, she walked out of the theatre as if nothing was ever uh, the matter with her. And we get very often many cases with snake bite. Uh, that's another type of snake, but you see bad management and again a, a dead arm. Uh, all you can do for that is amputation. Uh, that's, that's the boy the next day, but fortunate to get away with his life. Big tumour of the sarcoma and uh, we had histology of that one. We were fortunate that Mr. Hanney from uh, the hospital down the way there from Glasgow and uh, Shihani uh, here and Chloe, uh, they, they, that wasn't the operation, but they, they operated on it and did, a, did an amputation. Um, this is the team here at Chitokaloki. And then 500 Miles Charity by Olivia Giles, who is from uh, Glasgow as well. And uh, again, can't speak too highly of Olivia's work. Uh, all our amputees never had, uh, never had legs. Uh, prosthetic legs, when she came, uh, she got them legs. Some of them from snake bites, some from landmine injuries, etc. 
Uh, Flyspec do a similar thing. Uh, they're, they're the group that come up from Lusaka. Uh, Emmanuel Macasa was one of their surgeons, and they do that. Uh, they come up about three or four times a year and operate uh, on either plastic surgery or orthopedics. And Dr. Goran, who you might hear in the next few day, weeks, he does that. I don't touch something like that. I don't have a three-dimensional mind. He does, and he does a very, this is her six months later. And, uh, you know, we could do three or four of those children. They're all anesthetized with ketamine, and uh, it's quite an interesting procedure. You can talk about it afterwards if you want to discuss the anesthetics of things. Uh, Kaposi sarcoma, chemo chemotherapy. Little osteomyelitis, a lot of osteomyelitis, um, big chunks of bone, and uh, damaged legs. Julie Rachel does a lot of her Ponsetti techniques. She's, doing, she's a nurse, she's doing a tenotomy here. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, C4-5 type fracture, paralyzed. And we're very proud of that because Emmanuel's still alive with no pressure sores after four years because of this bed, which has got a electric bed and a changing mattress. Wonderful man, he's, he's a very courageous chap, Emmanuel. Crocodiles do a lot of damage to people. I, I'm not an environmentalist, I wouldn't mind if they were all exterminated. <laughs> but <laughs> shouldn't say that. Uh, but uh, this is the sort of thing they do. Uh, that, that child went four hours on an ox cart, got to the hospital, no doctor, was put in an ambulance, took through to us. Twelve hours later she arrived with us, belly full of river water and, and blood. And she did very well and went home. Uh, uh, as well. That's another crocodile injury, uh, loss of arm. Very, very dangerous creature. Those are the ones that survive. Martin is a diabetic and uh, uh, rewarding work. I did Martin's cataracts about seven years ago and once I was shopping in Lusaka, that's 700 miles, five or 600 miles away, and uh, this security man came running over to me, and I thought, goodness, has Lorraine been shoplifting, or have I been shoplifting? <laughs> and it was uh, Martin. He had, got a, he had uh, got a job now as a, um, as a security man in the, in the shop. And uh, now he's back with us because he got this foot problem. Uh, he's an insulin-dependent diabetic, and that was his foot. And, uh, this went, I noticed the, the, the college has podiatry, and uh, this, we had a podiatrist visiting us, and she put this on their website, and we got a lot of advice about it. Uh, it varied the advice, but what we did in the end was we took off the toe and grafted it, and it's done fairly well so far. Uh, double volvulus, for those of you who do general surgery. Um, so, oh yeah, yeah, that's a massive breast tumour, neglected, and uh, we back to the Glasgow link again, time is gone. But this is, Ian Gibson was a pathologist from Glasgow, he now, he's now a pathologist in Winnipeg, Canada. So we send all our pathology to him, and uh, we get back the results by email. And uh, the other one I meant to mention in connection with our HIV work is Mike Jones, who's here tonight. Mike also was out with us and was a big help to us initially setting up our HIV program. Uh, urology, that's a big bladder. I do open prostates and uh, transvesical. Uh, that was the urine come out of him, four or five liters. And uh, all our notes go in these tickets. If you want to come to a place where there's little paperwork, come to you talk about <laughs> That's about, uh, you know, you can get about five or six years of things on that. Uh, pulling teeth, if you want your teeth pulled, I don't recommend it, but I do a lot of pulling teeth. Uh, uh, X-rays, uh, there you are, drying, but used to be like that. Now, then along came Rodney Strachan, and he put in a digital system our x-rays now are done at shit at nine in the morning. They go to Rodney in Australia. He reports on them. Patient goes home at 12 with a report. So it's very, very efficient. Uh, that's the sonocyte scanners. Very, very, very useful. Um, and he taught me how to do scanning. So that we've now got three nice scans. Uh, make our, we do our best to make 
the surgery as safe as possible for our patients with oximetries, <coughs> oximeters, retinoblastoma or some similar type of tumor. Uh, local treatments are very harmful. They do multiple cuts sometimes, and that's a gangrenous leg as a result of those type of cuts. Uh, leprosy, there's quite a bit of leprosy still in the place. Rewarding, you, you get your section patients named after you. So that's David to the left and Andrew to your right. <laughs> and this one's probably David as well. <laughs> I first came to meet uh, Professor Galloway as a result of his daughter being out. She was a medical student. We get a lot of medical students from Edinburgh or Glasgow. and uh, They're a wonderful blessing and help to us. And then Jenny was uh, Professor Galloway's daughter. And she said, my father is professor of the Royal College of Surgeons. I thought, no, surely not. And uh, that is the most illust illustrious person we've had out with us. <laughs> and uh, triplets, um, Ross again. Uh, Rupert uteruses, obstetrics is always a large amount of the workload. Um, my first case that you took a look, it was ruptured uterus and ruptured bladder. You could talk for a long time about uh, the, these two girls had obstetric fistula. In November, we usually get Michael Breen up to do my, um, the fistulas, but we, we did about 10 fistulas there in November, just past. Uh, just in closing, you see that, that's an email from a Canadian missionary doctor working in Angola, 21st of March. Give a unit of my blood to a lady with a hemoglobin of four because of pre-existing malaria. Up at one to do a vacuum delivery on another, and then did the 6 a.m. teaching. At 10 a.m., give another half unit, stop because I knew you didn't have time to get a full unit to another lady brought in with a hemoglobin of two. She died just as I got the blood into her. They tried to do CPR, um, unsuccessful, and then he transports the body home to their family. I know of three maternal deaths in our area just within the last uh, month, really, one of which we were involved with ourselves. And this is the reality of uh, boots on the ground type thing in rural Africa. Uh, this is Dr. Mwansa, who's a highly gifted uh, Zambian doctor, has worked with us for the past four years. Technically, she's a very, very good operator. Uh, Mwansa is, she's just uh, got a uh, community medicine um, from the uh, masters from Edinburgh. is uh, leaving us at the end of the month. Uh, she's going into public health. And my question for you is, uh, boots on the ground, how, how do you keep them on the ground? Um, somebody who has the capacity and capability. But for most people, Central Africa is not a very inviting uh, place, and there's not much career prospects. So the challenge is to d improve that. This, back to that program, or that first slide. This kid got no analgesia. I can still hear his screams. And there was a, this was Congo, that recent article by the BBC, 300 tons of opioids every year are used in the world apparently. 0 0.1 are used in the developing world. It's almost impossible to get post-op, adequate uh, post-op analgesia. Um, that little boy is just a baby, he operated on two and a half days old just before we left. Anesthetic given by a nurse and as well. And I leave you with that statistic, and sorry for going over the time. Five billion people, uh, is the surgical and anesthetic challenge of our generation, I feel, is to achieve boots on the ground. And as I say, if I have any volunteers, uh, feel free to sign up. Thank you.